look who it is. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, it's almost Christmas at the time of posting, and my Christmas gift to all of you is a reminder of something that I've said before, but people seem to have forgotten. In 2019, <gasps> Potterless goes weekly. That is right. We are going weekly starting in 2019, which is great because that is when book seven starts as well, so it's all lining up just perfectly. This could not have been possible without all of the support of the listeners, of the people supporting on Patreon, everyone who helped me along with the podcast along the way. So I just want to say thank you, and I'm very excited to have twice as much Potterless starting in 2019. Speaking of getting more Potterless in your life, a reminder that we have live shows for Multitude on Thursday, January 17th, and Friday, January 18th in Seattle, the same weekend as PodCon. The Thursday show is at 7 p.m. The Friday show is at 10 p.m. There's going to be performances from all of the Multitude podcasts and a bunch of special guests. I'm super excited. If you want tickets, you can go to bit.ly slash Multitude in Seattle and get them now. They are selling out, so hurry up before they're gone. Also, if you remember Miel Bredo from episodes 47 and 48, she mentioned her podcast Punch Up the Jam. I was on it as a guest. I helped them dissect and try to improve the song I Wish by Skilo. It was very fun. I highly recommend it. I'm very biased, but I think it was very funny, so go check that out. It was such a good time. And speaking of good times, it's always a good time when I get to read off the new patrons on our team. So, shout out to Alexa K. Andrasani, Hella Song Fugel, Gal Shahoff, Kaylee Pinto, Raut Moskowitz, Jody Postman, Kira Kapilov, Lee Tarak, Madison Dudley, Britt Franz, Patrick Yehubian, Elsa Skoling, Ingrid Quistlocken, Vera Kolathan, Tesni Patti, Madison Frilly, Neil Fournier, Charlie Partney, Julia Marinch, Lisa Friedman, Wendy Fang, Callie and Michael, Rachel Kelly, Hannah White, Monique Buffet, Palash Sedam Setuar, Marie Christine Rula, Adam Dell, Hamp Jarlborn, Amelia Alexandra Kampainen, Tyler Naki, Nancy De La Pena, Mariah Salem, Myron Speed, Josh Meyer, Megan Breedlove Sprees, Allison Plitman, David, Laura Timschel, Amelie Parup Krebs, Ashley Y. Wiley, Emma Tiemann, Sally Crow, Jennifer Wendt, Josie Burkett, Michaela Svendova, Aona Pop, Soren Busk, Tori Mattis, Randy, Ruth Marie Jacob Hardage, and someone who made their name Quip City, a pronunciation fix for Kim Lucky and Sefren Baez. Shout out to Jamie, Tabaranfo, and Emma DeWitt who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to Noel Basel. Soleil and Tao, who upgraded to producer level status, as well as our new producers, Hala O'Keefe of the Inclusion Advocacy Collaborative, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Rebecca Shumway, Taya Handlin, and Patricia Cologne. They joined the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Alex, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Benjamin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamal, Anthony, Russell, Dustin, Katie, Audra, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossanne, Micah, Andrea, Nikki, Colette, Chrissy, Sharina, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Lovekesh, Shivani, Ali, Kalmage, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Jeremiah, Sarah, Jesus, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Natalie, Arna, Brandy, Melody, Kristen, Jonathan, Zach, Elisa, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Jonathan, Joe, Isabel, Steve, Vivian, Samuel, Victoria, Elena, Takari, Darlene, Brenna, Drake, James, Haley, Marino, Braden, Matthew, Taylor, Hannah, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Peter, Maria, Fonas, Natalie, Hermione, Victoria, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Cecily, Raul, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Heidi, Alexandra, John, Kamel, Jen, Ju, Sefren, Dusty, and Can't I Potter? Who never hit the wrong light switch when they're trying to turn on a particular light in a room. If you want to be like one of these amazing producer level patrons and get access to bonus episodes, my notes, director's commentary, discounts on the merch on the website, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless and get all of that today. But without further ado, let's get into episode 57 of Potterless covering chapters 29 and 30, the last two chapters of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, guest starring my best bud, Johnny Frolicstein. <laughs> Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the journey of a 26-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that 26-year-old man, and I am joined again, back for the third time, my good old buddy, Johnny Frolicstein. Johnny, how's it going? Y'all have to listen to me for a third hour. <laughs> <laughs> You poor souls. I like that last episode we talked about, oh no, after the first one, people were probably very upset. And then we did two more. Elon Musk is going to shut down the internet or whatever now. Oh, well, but first he's going to come up with a bad idea. Yeah, very timely. This is always fun when people make relevant jokes and then these episodes come out months later. This is at the time when he failed to save those Thai boys from the cave. This will be way after the fact. What's really funny is my normal person job is mechanical engineering. And one of the things that I get to do with work is my company does liquid nitrogen for SpaceX. 
at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. So when they do launches and stuff, we give them liquid nitrogen. And I was going to be there this upcoming weekend for a launch and the launch got delayed by a week and I'm pretty sure it's because he pulled away manpower from their normal SpaceX stuff to make this submarine thing that they did not end up using to save the Thai boy soccer team. (laughs) He's just like such a crazy person like he truly believes that he can solve any problem and that he's the expert on any problem he's like the ultimate guy. Yeah he started off as this cool guy who was doing stuff and then the more and more he does and we learn about him he seems like not the coolest dude he just should stop tweeting if he stopped tweeting he'd be fine that is the biggest thing is he is very obsessed with his image and his perception and he's always replying to people that write mean headlines about him on twitter and dude that's just no way to live he really wants to be tony stark that's like his thing yeah but the thing is at least tony stark just didn't care what other people think i think the downside to elon musk is that he cares so much about how he's perceived that's the catch 22 is if you want to be like tony stark you're never going to be like tony stark Mm, look at that well good thing we've spent three minutes talking about not harry (laughs) potter we are here to discuss the final two chapters of harry potter and the half blood prince which are some sad reflective chapters Not too many goofs to be had here, but, you know, that's that's how the book rounded out. So let's get right into it so we're not talking for a million hours. So chapter 29 is called The Phoenix Lament. Hagrid tries to get Harry to walk away from Dumbledore's body, but Harry does not want to leave Dumbledore's side. A soft voice tells Harry to come on and gets him to walk away. Obviously, this is Ginny before they reveal it. Harry doesn't realize who it is until he takes a couple more steps and then he sees her red hair and then he realizes it's Ginny. She just kind of had this innate power to snap him out of it without him even realizing it, which is very sweet. Ginny tells Harry that it is McGonagall's orders for him to go to the hospital wing and that everyone is already there. Harry asks who else is dead. Ginny says no one, but Harry mentions the dark mark and Malfoy saying that he stepped over a body and Ginny reveals that it was Bill and uh, not Bill. We like Bill. Why couldn't it be? I don't know. Who's the like Pansy or uh, Zabini, but not Bill. Yeah, Bill's cool. He has an earring. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So then she says, it's all right. He's dot, dot, dot alive and those dot dot dots are very telling it is a very telling ellipsis Ginny weasley dude i love this i love this part yeah and this part makes me understand why people did not like me making fun of bill weasley early on is because this tragic thing happened to him so harry can tell from her voice that something boded ill Harry asks if she's sure. Ginny says yes, but he's a bit of a mess because Greyback attacked him. And I realized, oh, right. I totally forgot that this happened, even though it was maybe a chapter and a half ago. But yeah, there was someone that Greyback alluded to attacking. It is good to know that at least he's not dead. But this now does put it in perspective. Oh, okay. When I was making fun of Bill for not being cool or whatever... People have a softer spot for him because he was viciously attacked by this horrible, horrible person. So I think it's just like super freaky that they don't know what the after effects are going to be because yeah. there's no like yeah. evidence of a werewolf who's not transformed biting someone. Like how fucked up is Greyback? Yeah, he's like a pseudo cannibal. It's very interesting. Yeah, man. So I felt really bad for him. You're right. The whole aspect of not knowing what's going to happen next makes it extremely terrifying. Just the unknown of it. Right. Like, truly, I guess, Bill, what is Bill now? You, like, you don't know. It's, it's, it's good. It's real good. Yeah. It's very well-crafted and is a very unique thing to add to the story. Something I did not see coming. And I feel closer to Bill Weasley because I've been playing this Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery iPhone game, and Bill is one of your best friends. And he's so good in the game. He's so nice. He's super cool. He's a great bro. He's a couple years older than you, so he plays somewhat of an older brother type figure to you. He is super hunky in the game. Like, they make him out to be the hottest dude. He's got this, like, flowing hair and this big smile, and he looks cool. He's got, like, a button-down shirt with a tie kind of loose and his sleeves rolled up. Like, he looks much cooler in this game than he was described with his stupid ponytail and his dragon skin boots and his one earring. Bill Weasley in the phone game, cool as hell. (laughs) But... Because I have played this game and he's one of your closest friends, I now feel a lot more 
upset and more heartbroken when this happens to Bill because over the span of just having to play this game recently, I like the dude a lot now. That's actually why they released it for people like you who are reading it for the first time. They could play the game. They heard the Potterless episodes and they were like, all right, this kid's making fun of Bill Weasley for no good they, reason. Oh, Bill's not like a hipster man bun asshole earring. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so they get to the hospital wing. Pumphrey says that Bill will never look the same, which is a huge blow since he's the hot one. Nice. They don't know what's going to happen to him since Greyback wasn't in werewolf form when he bit him. Harry then asks Ginny about the other bodies that he saw on the ground. He already knew this was Neville, so I don't know why he's asking about it. But Ginny says it's Neville who Madam Pumphrey says will make a full recovery. But then another one was Flitwick who got knocked out. But he is fine, and he's already left the hospital wing because he wanted to watch over the Ravenclaws, which, man, Flitwick is a G. What a boss. He is suffering probably from a concussion, but <laughs> doesn't care and wants to help out his students. Yeah, I, Flitwick, like, they make him so lame in the movies. He's just, like, comic relief because he's short. I'm like, come mm-hmm. on. Like, yeah, it's so n- not cool. overdone and dated, and clearly this guy's a badass. He's the Ravenclaw head of house, which he's got to be brilliant. And, they... and he's the dueling champion of Hogwarts. Yeah, and, and he's also the short guy. Way fun. Like... Yeah, uh, I don't like that they do that. And you got to think, this is a school that has Snape. And we've seen how good Snape is at dueling. And Flitwick is still the dueling champion. So Flitwick has to be a beast. Can we talk about what, like how that duel must have played out? The, the Flitwick versus Snape matchup? That would be so good. I mean, it's kind of like the Pablo Sanchez backyard baseball thing where Pablo Sanchez is such a good hitter in it because he's so short that he's got a very small batter's box. So it makes him that much more powerful. Flitwick... To be fair, he is short. It's probably harder to hit him with spells. That's so good. That's such a good point. Right? He uses his physical limitations to his advantage. It's like Yoda in Star Wars. He's just (laughs) dodging and moving all over the place. Speaking of the Harry Potter iPhone game, they make him a boss in the iPhone game. And he's got a killer mustache and amazing blue plaid pants. He is a absolute boss in the game. So don't worry. Dude, you're kind of, you're you're talking me into this game. I I think I want to give it a try. Just do it and just put up with the frustration of how long you have to wait. It's worth it. The story is very fun. And you could just make your name something stupid like when you play pokemon Pokemon and you make your name butt or whatever you could make your name something like that because it's very often that the professors call you by your full name and your rival's like hey (laughs) fuck face like (laughs) i did the my favorite thing to do with pokemon names is you make your rival's name a something so like a jerk or an idiot or a bitch solely for the line because professor oak says he forgets what his grandson's name is and then he can say the sentence that's right my grandson's a bitch (laughs) so that's the only reason you do that and then you make your player's name a dot 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 he because then anytime you do something it'll go uh he found a pokeball (laughs) Uh, he found a rare candy. Uh, he won the fight, which is great. And then I named my, what did I, I named my Charmander, uh, I mean, comma, he. So it'll be like, I mean, he used flamethrower. <laughs> and then I made my Pikachu dot, 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 please, with a question mark at the end. So then when you throw it, it's like, go, please. I mean, he is confused. <laughs> I mean, he hurt himself in confusion. Really <laughs> <laughs> what he's trying to learn to do tech. I mean, he's trying to learn flamethrower, but he, only- but he already <laughs> has four attacks. <laughs> like, I mean, he learned flamethrower. He's like some like <laughs> shitty barista who like is telling you you can't do something. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> You also could make the name of anything, I think, so that the narrator is very wishy-washy. I think he used (laughs) flamethrower. I think he found a rare candy. (laughs) So anyway, now that we've taken three separate asides from one comment. Well, can you imagine they made a Harry Potter sort of like Pokemon Go style game where you could like learn spells? Oh, dude, they literally are making that. I have a friend that works for Niantic and they're making that. Oh, that's real cool. I am very excited to play it. I think they overcomplicated Pokemon Go a lot. And I think if it had just been Yeah, once they added the new generation, I stopped. And that's exactly when I stopped playing Pokemon as a kid. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think if it was just as simple as like, I can walk up to you and battle you or duel you or whatever, that would be way better. I still get the emails because I haven't unsubscribed. And a lot of the features they've added now are really cool. Like you can trade items in between players and stuff. I think the problem was they released the game and then it was really fun. And then they didn't release any of the new features. And then people got bored of it. Whereas I think if they waited one year 
before they released it and they had all these features that they have in now like the raid thing is actually really cool and the new way that they do the gyms is a lot better than the original system i think if they sat on it for a year and then had it come out i think people would be playing it incessantly and would never stop yeah because all the new features sound awesome but i just haven't played for a while and even though i'm level 30 i just know that there's going to be people that are level 50 something and i just don't want to have to grind to get to the point where i'm one of the better players again and i just don't want to deal with it i think you're right but there's also definitely gotta be some sort of nostalgia factor like people were gonna like love that in the same way they were excited about like fucking fuller house for one episode and then realized it was like dumb <laughs> you know like i think that always comes into play when you bring up something from the 90s or fucking where that thing is you know that people love yeah and that's what fueled it and that's also what kind of made me stop playing is that once they introduced the new pokemon and i kept catching all these pokemon i didn't recognize yeah there goes the nostalgia factor because i don't care about this one that looks like a ladybug i don't know who these are these are weird right anyway so many sides we're gonna be this episode is gonna be an hour and a half long sorry uh so one of the death eaters died from one of the random evada cadavers that the blonde death eater was just throwing around willy-nilly but that is it in terms of deaths so nobody that we care about is dead thankfully aside from dumbledore Ginny says that the felix felicis was key as everything seemed to simply miss them. So thank goodness that Harry left it for them. Otherwise, someone we care about might have died. This kind of begs the question, like, why you're not hearing about Felix Felicis all the time in the Wizarding World? Because if I learned how to make that, I would make a big old vat of it and just, like, make a killing. You could make so much if you sold Felix Felicis. I'm telling you, they gotta make a lot of it because Felix Felicis is clearly the most powerful potion in the Harry Potter universe. No, by far. Like, every other potion is super lame compared to Felix. Like, <laughs> you could make so much money if you just nailed how to make And I know, like, Slughorn said you can't have too much of it or whatever, but, like, you also can't have mm -hmm. too much, you know, alcohol, and people make a killing off that, too. Like, yeah. I think Fred and George should make it. They definitely need to start selling it. Is it is it not legal? Like, what is preventing people from taking this once a month and, like, have the best day ever? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess you got to find out, like, what the limitation of, like, how much you can take it is or whatever. But regardless, if even if it's something where, like, you should just do it once in your life, this potion clearly works wonders. Severe wonders. Sell it to muggles if you market it right, too. Yeah, totally. But that would be problematic. I'm glad that Harry ultimately made the call to leave it with them and not take it with him because clearly him and Dumbledore didn't need it on their journey at all, but everyone back at the castle needed it pretty badly. Do you think you would have made that call? Yeah, I think so. I think Harry's reasoning of like, I don't need this luck potion stuff. I have freaking Dumbledore with me. It seems like the pretty obvious and smart call to make. It makes more sense, especially given that Harry's directions for them was to try to figure out what Malfoy is doing. That is something that needs more luck. Whereas Dumbledore and Harry doing the Horcrux thing just needs skill. I think that it's two different things at play. It makes sense that Harry didn't take it with him. That's fair. So Harry enters the hospital wing. Everyone is crowded around Bill's bed. Hermione runs up and hugs Harry. Lupin asks if Harry's okay, and Harry very quickly just goes, I'm all right, how's Bill? Which, fuck yes, Harry, fuck yes. I absolutely love his dedication to making sure everyone else is okay the narrator then says nobody answered which is not a good sign apparently bill's face is just absolutely rough pumphrey is putting on some green lotion on his face harry thinks of snape healing the sectum sempra and wonders why pomfrey isn't doing the same thing asks her if there's some sort of charm that she can use and she says no as there is no known cure for werewolf bites Harry brings up the point that it wasn't on the full moon, though, so is it really a werewolf bite? And Ron kind of asks about the same thing. Lupin says that he doesn't think Bill will become a full werewolf, but there may be some sort of contamination. Lupin says that the wounds are cursed and will never heal, and he may end up having some wolf-like tendencies. So I'm very intrigued to see what happens with Bill going forward. I can't get over Fenrir Greyback doing that while he wasn't transformed. It is probably, like, the, one of the top most fucked up things in the series, like, by far. Oh, easily. No contention. No contention at all. Especially because he's still targeting children. So he is not only someone that has cannibalistic tendencies or passions or desires or whatever, but specifically children cannibalism, which is very weird. I guess Bill is grown up. He's basically a full-fledged adult at this point, but it's still weird that he's like, oh yeah, I love eating kids even when I'm a man. It's very strange. Yeah, <laughs> they were like, oh Jesus, Fenrir's here and there's kids here. Like, we gotta, we gotta hide those guys. <laughs> Ron, in a cringe-tastic moment, says that he thinks Dumbledore can help 
and he should help since Bill fought the Death Eaters on his orders, Ginny has to break the news to him. Ron is absolutely shook. Lupin collapses. Tonks asks what happened, and then Harry recaps the whole story. This is such a, like, sort of, you forget that just because you're following this omniscient or, you know, third person or whatever narrator, Mm -hmm. you sort of forget that information doesn't travel that fast, especially Mm -hmm. after an event like this. And so to see someone find out, you know, secondhand that it happened is just absolutely gut-wrenching. It's so bad. It's crushing. It's completely crushing. So then in the darkness, they hear a phoenix singing. It seems very sad and like the song is full of lament, but Harry still notes that it is beautiful. They all stop to listen, and it eases their pain a bit. So after this happens, McGonagall comes in. She looks very rough as well, and she says that Molly and Arthur are on their way. McGonagall asks for a recap, and Harry just straight up delivers the news that Snape killed Dumbledore. Again, we we see this secondhand sort of, hey, what's what's up? What's going on? You know, where's Dumbledore? Like, ooh, mm-hmm. it just fucking sucks. Oh, it's yeah. so hard to read. Uh, it's just terrible. McGonagall begins to faint, but Madame Pomfrey conjures a chair in order to catch her. Madame Pomfrey is just so great. I love her. She's very underrated in the series. McGonagall is just straight up in utter disbelief. She has a quote that says, We all wondered, but he trusted always Snape, just lots of dot, 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 not really being able to put together a complete sentence. Lupin chalks up the situation to occlumency, saying that Snape was able to use occlumency to trick Dumbledore into trusting him. Tonks says that she always thought Dumbledore knew something about Snape that we didn't, which justified him trusting Snape, which I think is the correct answer. It seems like the most logical choice. So all of them go on and on a bit about what's going on, but then Harry says that Snape gave the information to Voldemort to kill Harry's parents, and his whole apology, Dumbledore saying it's the biggest regret, blah, 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 Harry thinks it's complete bullshit. Lupin is surprised that Dumbledore believed it, bringing up the same point that Harry did, that Snape absolutely hated James. Harry then goes on to say that Snape didn't think that his mother, Lily, was worth a damn because she was a muggle-born, citing the flashback time when Harry heard Snape call her a mudblood, but he doesn't actually say how he knew this. But I do think it's pretty funny, given that, unfortunately, I know the spoiler, that Snape had a big, big crush on Lily Potter. I was just going to say, man, this is such a good little tidbit, and I bet you felt in on the secret when you were reading this. You are like, oh. Yes, yeah. very much so. He thinks she was worth a damn. <laughs> he thought she was the most worth of dams. So McGonagall <laughs> then bursts worth out saying dams. that it's all... <laughs> <laughs> that it's all her fault. The book says, quote, she was all disorientated, which I thought was a typo, thinking that J.K. Rowling might not know what the word disoriented is. But according to Google, British people actually say disorientated instead of disoriented, which doesn't make any damn sense. Oh, that's awesome. I'm sitting here with my stupid American copy being like, Mike, I don't know what you're looking at. So, Oh, it, it says uh, disoriented? It's Yeah, it's disoriented in the American copy. Uh, okay, so I listened to the Stephen Fry audiobook for this particular section. Got it. So, so he, he said, said disorientated. disorientated. Okay, that, I, that's good to know that they changed it for the English version so that it was correct. Yeah, you know, correct <laughs> as... American English is correct. Why would you add a U to color? Why would you add a U to favorite? Why would you add an I to aluminum? It's just extra letters. I think we did the subtracting. I don't think they did the adding. (laughs) Yeah, we're efficient. (laughs) (laughs) We don't need these garbage extra letters and syllables. Ah, yes. The United States of America, a model of efficiency, especially Uh, right now. We were so good until November of 2016. We were so good. And then that bullshit happened. We had the coolest dude that was funny and nice and good at basketball. Ugh. Very good at basketball. Dude. Lefty J. skills. And now, I don't know, I wouldn't even trust Trump to like walk down a flight of stairs. What do you think the over-under is on flights of stairs <laughs> that man has taken in office? I'd say two. I thought you were going to ask me what the over-under is on the Obama-Trump one-on-one basketball game. <laughs> oh, you'd have to give Trump a 10-point lead if they were playing to 11 and Obama would still win. Even if it was make it, take it for Trump and not for he Obama. You'd get murked. You would get absolutely <laughs> murked. Did you watch that Ted Cruz versus Jimmy Kimmel basketball thing? It was I don't know. No, I don't care about that. They played one-on-one. I, I only heard about it. And then I watched the quote unquote highlights from it. It was very disappointing. I couldn't watch more than 12 seconds of it. I mean, it's two like old dudes who that don't, don't play basketball do playing basketball. They don't do that. Yeah. It's very bad because uh, basketball is, I think, the sport the most where if you don't play it, it is very obvious to see. 
because you can kind of fake it in some other sports. Like you can kind of fake it in soccer as long as you're roughly athletic and you don't try to do a bunch of dribble moves. But basketball, yeah, fakers, yeah. it's just such an unnatural motion to try to put a ball into a hoop 10 feet up in the air that if you yeah. don't do it, it is very obvious. I think the one other obvious sport that you could tell that if someone hasn't played besides Quidditch <laughs> is baseball. Like oh, if you yeah. watch someone throw a baseball and they don't throw it and they're like, like it's really, it's really, you can tell. Yeah. I would also say probably ultimate Frisbee as well, because if you don't know how to throw a Frisbee straight, <laughs> it looks real bad. Indeed. And the whole point of Indeed ultimate does. is you have to stick it to a particular rectangle. <laughs> you can't throw it too wide. <laughs> Anyway, McGonagall says that she sent Flitwick to fetch Snape to help them, so she feels guilty because she doesn't think Snape knew that the Death Eaters were there before Flitwick told him. So she is blaming herself because indirectly she is the reason that Snape figured out that the Death Eaters were trying to attack. I think this is entirely reasonable of McGonagall to say this, mm -hmm. but it also kind of reminded me of those fucking people who, when some tragedy happens, they're like, oh my god. Three hours before it happened, my cousin's dog was on that same block and they saw, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just like, stop making it about you. Like, don't do that. Like, Yeah, I think it's different here because she has survivor's guilt. It's different than the flip. It is different here, but it reminded me of this. Yes, yes, for sure. I think she just got a survivor's guilt situation. Very reminiscent of when Harry was blaming himself and Tonks was as well for the ministry situation where Tonks said that she was fighting Bellatrix before. So if she was able to take care of Bellatrix, Bellatrix wouldn't have killed Sirius and Harry also feeling it. But Harry definitely more guilt because his brash thinking is what got them into that mess. I was going to say his survivor guilt is probably somewhere rooted in the fact that it was his fucking fault. <laughs> Oh, man. Lupin tells her that it's not her fault. McGonagall then talks about not knowing how the Death Eaters got in. So Harry fills her in on that situation. And she says, quote, so they got in through the room of requirement. And Harry shoots a look at Ron and Hermione, who look devastated, which I wanted a whole chapter of them saying told you so. But obviously not in these circumstances where it is shrouded in the death of Dumbledore. I'm very happy that I got my told you so moment because I felt bad for Harry. But I not like this. Yeah. Not like this. <laughs> Doesn't feel good. <laughs> does it mm -mm. ron says that they listen to harry ron hermione and Ginny waited outside the room of requirement all night and malfoy ran out of the room at one point about an hour after they got there with his hand of glory which gives light only to the holder have we learned about the hand of glory before or is this the only time it's been mentioned i believe it was mentioned earlier in book six is this something that he bought at borgen and burks i think that's where it's mentioned before okay. is in borgen and burks i don't remember if it's in this book or earlier uh-huh but but it's a borgen and burks item yeah yeah no it's, yeah this isn't the first time it's coming yeah up. because hermione kind of does the remember or either hermione or Ginny does a remember it gives light only to the holder which seemed very much like a hey reader in case you've forgotten what this thing is that we've mentioned before <laughs> so that was helpful for me there's a moment in book seven that's going to infuriate you because she does that in like a crucial moment she just like drop something that you've never fucking heard of before i think you mentioned so this earlier dumb. in either this recording or a previous episode but i'm i'm not looking forward to you're it you're gonna lose your shit is it a good one or am i gonna be angry you're gonna be so mad i was so mad <sighs> it actually it happens twice within like 50 pages of each other oh no everyone listening is gonna know what i'm talking about this doesn't sound like fun at all. <laughs> i hope it's not uh i don't i don't even want to guess you won't if be able to the guess the deluminator no, slash put out i'll be, be mad if it's something like the pygmy puff is important i'll also be upset it's, no it's not like that it's more like something <laughs> don't tell me anything about it okay. i just want to be furious yeah when it happens. you will you will <laughs> don't you worry so Ginny says that he must have been keeping track of if the coast was clear or not, because as soon as he noticed them, he threw something into the air and it went all pitch black. Ron says that this was Peruvian instant darkness powder from Fred and George. And Ron says that he's pretty upset and wants to yell at them for not gauging and monitoring who they sell their items to. Lumos and Incendio didn't do anything. And then Ginny says a quote, which makes me so sad. She says, all we could do was grope our way out of the <laughs> corridor. Like someone died, Ginny. Yeah. <laughs> someone died. And you're talking about groping. They couldn't use any curses since it was too dark. They were afraid they might hit each other, but they could tell that people were running past them. So this, we can assume, is all of the Death Eaters running out of the room in requirement with Malfoy. As soon as they got out and saw the light, the Death Eaters were gone. Lupin says that luckily they ran into him and Neville almost immediately and told them what was happening. 
Then one of the Death Eaters named Gibbon ran up the stairs, made the dark mark, meaning that they had decided on this whole plan before they left the Room of Requirement. Dude, so this Gibbon fellow, mm -hmm. I've read these books a lot of times, and I've played the Harry Potter Sporkle game where you try to name all the characters, Yeah, and I've done trivia and succeeded at Harry Potter trivia. When I was rereading this chapter, I had never heard that name. There, give it, who the fuck is that? I have no idea. This might be the only mention of him it because definitely learn, is. he dies pretty quick. His life lasts three sentences in this Definitely book. the only time <laughs> Gibbon is ever referenced is right here. Can we pour one out for our homeboy Gibbon? Yeah, in memoriam of Gibbon. Lived way too short. In the arms of <laughs> Anyway, so he gets up, he does the dark mark. He must have not liked the thought of waiting for Dumbledore alone, though Lupin says. Uh, so he ran back down and then was quickly killed by a killing curse that just missed Lupin. We can assume that this was launched by that big blonde Death Eater that was just throwing stuff all over the place. Hermione says that she and Luna were waiting outside of Snape's office for ages and nothing happened. But then Flitwick came around and frantically burst into Snape's office. Then they heard a loud thud and Snape came out saying that Flitwick had collapsed and that they should care for him while Snape goes to take on the Death Eaters. So this is uh, this is clearly Snape doing something to make Flitwick pass out so that he can be ditched. But my question here, why would he need to do that? Is there something that Flitwick knows? or, or I, don't, I don't get the point of making Flitwick pass out. It doesn't really seem like he's that crucial that he couldn't be in the fight with all the other people from the order i think it was just to get well a it was to sort of like lessen their numbers b mm -hmm. to get hermione and luna out of the way yeah i guess he's trying to reduce the amount of people that could see what is going down yeah so hermione now feels guilty that they didn't realize the situation lupin also says that it's not their fault Snape was able to run through the cursed barriers that the Death Eaters put up, even though the Order couldn't, so clearly he knew some sort of dark art spell that the rest of the Order didn't know. Tonks and Lupin revealed that the big Death Eater let out a jinx that made half of the ceiling collapse. And then that is when Snape and Malfoy came running out, and they just kind of let Snape and Malfoy pass because they thought that the two of them were running away since they were being attacked by the Death Eaters. They had no idea that Snape had turned, so to speak, and murdered Dumbledore. After letting those two pass, Greyback and the crew returned, so they just resumed fighting them. Tonks says that she thought she heard Snape yell something, but couldn't tell what. Harry tells her that what he said was, it's over, because they had done what they came to do, which is rough. And this whole section of this chapter is rough because it's everyone basically recapping what happened, and each person has some sort of facilitation into letting this go down and it sucks because it's this thing where oh we were kind of guilty because of this oh we were kind of guilty because of this we were kind of guilty be right. because of this it's all those different little puzzle pieces it's just this whole thing where everyone feels guilty and yes you have the felix felicis keeping them alive but this almost feels like an anti felix felicis where all of these weird situations had to come together to make this happen yes and no but i guess you could also maybe say that the felix felicis I don't know who drank it. I don't know if they all split it or whatever. But the one thing that you could say is this is a very much like Infinity War, Doctor Strange kind of there's only one outcome where we can get rid of Voldemort situation. And maybe a necessary step in getting Voldemort gone is Snape killing Dumbledore. I guess that's the only justification you could say. Right. And I, um, I also think all of their sort of mistakes are a little bit rooted in the fact that Dumbledore trusts Snape, right? Because mm -hmm. they let Snape and Malfoy walk by, they let Snape go after Flitwick is down, right? Like, everything is sort of centered around this fact that, like, all these, like, choke points where you could have stopped Snape, but you were never going to because you had no reason to. Yeah, exactly, because Dumbledore trusts him, so we should trust him. After Harry breaks the news that what he said was it's over, everyone falls silent. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley then enter. Molly is in tears. She doesn't even give a damn when Arthur asks about Dumbledore. She is purely focused on Bill because she's a true and good mom. She's worried about his face, noting that it's not necessarily the most important thing, but she does say he was a very handsome little boy. Molly's just so pure. Mm. Fleur then comes running in as well. Molly goes on to cry about how he would have been married, and Fleur, in the ultimate rebound, takes offense to this, asking, what do you, or so I'm trying to do French for this one, what do you mean, no, there's no V's in the French, what do you mean would have been? And she asks Molly if, 
this means that he won't still love her because of the werewolf stuff. Molly hints at the scars and then Fleur asks Molly, oh, you think that I'm not going to love him because of his looks? She comes so close to executing this interaction perfectly, but then she ends it with, quote, I think I am attractive enough for the both of us, which <laughs> no, so no, Fleur, <laughs> you were so close. You were so close. To then being she, amazing. And then she just peppers in how uh, damn hot she is. Uh, damn. Just a bit outside. <laughs> Fleur then grabs the green lotion from her and starts to put it on Bill's face. Everyone is anticipating a huge explosion from Molly, but instead, Molly is very happy and offers Fleur a tiara from Auntie Muriel to wear during the wedding, saying she thinks it'll go well with Fleur's hair. Fleur accepts, they kind of share an awe moment, and they embrace in a tear-filled hug. I love these sort of instances, which is like kind of a little bit of a dated thing, I think for you know when these books were coming out there's all these instances in which ron and harry both are like oh women you know yeah <laughs> it's like <laughs> they're just like complete doofuses <laughs> like of course they're crying and hugging right now right like this is a very emotional moment but like harry yeah. and ron are just like oh <laughs> yeah it's it's a bit dated it definitely is a bit dated tonks then butts in saying you see she still wants to marry him even though he's been bitten she doesn't care and this, at first, I thought was Tonk actually liking Bill, not it just being a theory from Molly or something that Molly wanted to happen. And I thought that, oh, maybe she and Lupin had talked about it and Lupin thought they could be a thing if Fleur was going to be too superficial. But... Then Lupin's reply changes everything and is something I did not see coming at all. Lupin says it's different, barely moving his lips. Bill will not be a full werewolf. The cases are completely different. And then I realized, oh, she loves Lupin. Boo, boo, boo. The Patronus was Lupin. Uh, it explains so many things. Yeah, I had a huge aha moment when this happened. Pull that rug out from under you right now. Yep. I did not see this coming at all, at all, at all, at all, at all. Harry makes the same realization of me where he's like, what? Uh, uh. And Tonks yells at Lupin that she doesn't care and she's told him a million times. Lupin says he's told her a million times that he's too old, too poor, and too dangerous. Molly thinks Lupin is being ridiculous. Lupin says he's not because Tonks deserves someone young and whole. But then Arthur chimes in saying that sometimes young and whole men don't remain so, nodding at Bill, which is heartbreaking. Ugh, it's so sad. It's so sad. But Lupin says that this is not the time to discuss this, which is very correct by Lupin. This is not the time to try to talk about if him and this younger girl should date. There are more pressing matters in that Bill is fucked up and Dumbledore is dead. Lupin is so right in this moment. Easily the best marauder. No contest at all. He's so much better than James and Sirius. And then McGonagall's like, well, Dumbledore would have been happier than anybody to think there was a little more love in the world. And I was like, oh, fuck you. That is so... Yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. It's like... <laughs> Not the time and place. You're literally ganging up on this guy and, like, telling him that, like, this dead person that everyone loved would have been happy to know. She's like, Sh <laughs> right now? <laughs> Not the time. So Hagrid comes in very teary-eyed, saying that he moved the body. Sprout got the kids back in bed, and Slughorn informed the ministry. McGonagall tells Hagrid that in addition to the heads of house, but Slughorn replacing Snape, she wants him to join her in a meeting in her office. McGonagall walks out with Harry, saying that they're going to go to her office. Harry, halfway through the walk, realizes that they're headed to Dumbledore's office, but then he realizes, oh, right, she's the deputy headmistress. Now she's just the headmistress. Now this is her office. Two things here. First, we get a good silver lining of McGonagall being headmistress next book, I hope. And second, here's a question. Are we going to get a Dumbledore painting? And then is Harry going to be able to talk to Dumbledore? Like, isn't everything okay? Interesting thoughts, Mr. Schubert. Right? Like, my whole big thing was, oh, man, how the hell is Harry going to figure out where the rest of the Horcruxes are? Oh, wait, he can talk to the painting of Dumbledore. This was a very common thing that got thrown around after book six came out, pre-book seven. Yeah. That's all that I'll say. McGonagall then gets into the office, wants to know what Harry and Dumbledore were doing, but Harry won't tell her since Dumbledore told him to tell no one except for the squad. Now, the book then does go on to mention that there is a Dumbledore painting in the office, right? But it just says that he's, like, sleeping or something? Yeah. Is, is, it, is it rude to wake him up? Are you supposed to wait a long time after they die? Like, what's the, what's the protocol here? Painting etiquette. I'm very confused of how it works from death to painting. Are they asleep even? Or, like what, like, what are you talking to when you're talking to a painting? Yeah, I'm very confused. 
did they have the painting there and then when he died it showed up or did they paint the painting and then once he died it comes to life i really need a big explanation of how the paintings work because it's very confusing because we have learned that the paintings can feel emotions since the fat lady cried her eyes out over the death of dumbledore yeah it's very confusing to me. I would have loved the scene where Harry and McGonagall get to the office and, like, the dude's sitting there, like, painting the painting. Dumbledore's... Oh, <laughs> oh man. And they're like, can we, can we have the space? <laughs> <laughs> so here's what Harry should do for the seventh book. He should get a very tiny canvas in a frame and commission <laughs> someone to make a very tiny Dumbledore painting. And then he can keep Dumbledore in his pocket because we've learned that paintings can teleport if they're in another painting. And then Harry's got a painting of Dumbledore in his pocket. That's actually what happens. That better be what happens. He commissions a painter to have paint tiny Dumbledore. <gasps> oh, take the locket, the locket that is the fake Horcrux, and get someone to paint Dumbledore on the inside of the locket. Then carry that around, and you've got Dumbledore all the time, right? Again, I'm just like blushing so hard right now, and the reason for that is because you're predicting everything exactly right, and I don't want to say anything. You know, you're just nailing it. Oh, God. <laughs> he commissions a so painter. Much. You're he the worst person. <laughs> you're the worst person. You're the worst so, person. And, and the best person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, past Mike. Let's ease up a bit because it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Tab for a Cause. Do you use the internet like me, like a trash fire garbage person where you have 6,000 tabs open at the same time and you're not helping anyone? You're not helping yourself because you have so many tabs that the tabs are so small you can't even read what the sites they're for. You're not helping your computer because the RAM is exploding and you're not helping your own stress because you have 6,000 tabs open. That's where Tab for a Cause comes in because every time you open a new tab on your browser, you donate to charity. It's it's incredible. The new page that opens up has a nice, serene, calm background. It tells you the time, and then it allows you to donate to charities. They have a plethora of wonderful charities you can donate to, and the new tab feature is actually functional. You can put widgets, notes, bookmarks, all the sort of useful stuff, and all you need to do to get started is go to tabforacause.org slash potterless. That's T-A-B-F-O-R-A-C-A-U-S-E dot org slash potterless, and you can get it started today. It's a Google Chrome extension. It's super easy to add. I did it. It literally took me 15 seconds. I'm not exaggerating. And I've already donated to my first charity. It's great. I open a lot of new tabs. It adds up. And then you're actually being productive with it rather than just destroying your computer's RAM and your own sanity. Now you can be nice and calm and donate to charity. And again, all you have to do is go to tabforacause.org slash Potterless to get started today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by HelloFresh. Look, cooking is great and great for you, but it takes a lot of steps. You gotta figure out what you wanna cook. You gotta go to the store. You gotta pick out the right amount of ingredients. You gotta buy the ingredients. You gotta go home. You gotta prepare all of the ingredients. Then you gotta cook, and then you gotta clean after. That's an eight-step process. What if you had someone that could delete the first six steps? Well, that's where HelloFresh comes in, because they are in the business of of step deletion, and by step deletion, I mean they are a meal kit delivery service that sends fresh prepackaged ingredients to your door and they take care of all of the annoying parts of cooking. Each box is made up of fresh and responsibly obtained ingredients chosen from the highest rated farms. You're not gonna get E. coli or any of that crap that was in romaine lettuce in your situation. Only the good stuff from HelloFresh. And you can feel confident when cooking because they send you little pictures step by step so you know at each step along the way, oh, I'm doing a great job. Yeah, go get them, Richard. And you're not gonna spend all night in the kitchen because each recipe only takes about 30 minutes, which is fantastic because a lot of times cooking can just escape you and oh wow, I've been cooking dinner for an hour and 45 minutes minutes. And above all else, a HelloFresh account is super easy to manage and can be flexible around your schedule. You get to pick your exact delivery date for your boxes so you can make sure if you're, I don't know, going home for the holidays for two weeks, you don't get a box of food that's going to get moldy on your doorstep. It's fantastic. And Potterless listeners can get a total of $60 off. That is $20 off your first three boxes if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless60 and then enter promo code Potterless60. That's HelloFresh.com slash Potterless60 and enter promo code Potterless60 to get $60 off, $20 off each of your first three boxes. That's amazing because the prices of HelloFresh are already great. Now you're getting a discount off. You're getting a discount off of making dinner easier to cook. I don't know what else to do to convince you. Head on over to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless60, enter code Potterless60, and get your fresh ingredients delivered straight to your door today. McGonagall keeps trying to get Harry to tell her, saying that, oh, the situation has changed now that Dumbledore died, but Harry will not give in. Her first argument is Harry, like, or she asks Harry what they were doing, and Harry's like, I'm not going to tell you that. 
And then she's like, Harry, it might be important. Like, no shit. <laughs> Harry, this could be important. This might be something you want to tell me. I don't understand why he didn't. I would trust McGonagall enough to tell her. Or, I mean, this is just Harry being dumb and not asking enough questions, which is a common theme throughout the entire books. When Dumbledore mentions that there is the chance of him dying on this mission, Harry should have asked, okay, so if you do die, can I talk to McGonagall? That's, I mean, that seems like a logical first question. I sort of don't understand the necessity to keep the Horcruxes secret. Uh, yes, I don't understand it either. Why would you crowdsource it? Right? You could, like, have every- <laughs> I guess the thought is that you don't want word to spread and Voldemort to hear. So what? If everyone knows, that is like a strictly better situation than if no one knows. I don't think there's any world in which more people hunting is worse than less people hunting. Yeah, at the very least, you can just tell a very tight-knit group of people in the order that you trust. You tell McGonagall, you tell Kingsley Shacklebolt, you tell Lupin, and then that's probably it. And then you just have a somewhat larger search party team to find the Horcruxes. Dude, you're going to get some good Lupin stuff in book seven. Lupin's got a lot of shit coming. Good. He's great. I like him a lot. I was so disappointed when he got fired because he was the best teacher that they've ever had yeah. of anything, not just of Defense Against the Dark Arts. He's the best professor of any of them. Yeah. Except for maybe Professor Vector, who I think does not get enough love. The arithmancy professor. Vector? I barely know her. <laughs> the arithmancy professor? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my. Uh. I actually know her. I don't know how you barely know anything about her. Well, Potterless is now over. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> Did I end it? I ended uh, Potterless. <laughs> yeah, yep. You've murdered no it. No more episodes. The, the episode and the whole podcast is now over. So Harry won't give in, but he does tell her about Rosmerta. And McGonagall's like, Rosmerta? Which, yep. I barely I'm know so her. That I, oh, <laughs> God damn it. That not mm. So Sprout, Slughorn, <laughs> Flitwick, and Hagrid then enter. And we get another awful, awful word choice from ejaculated. J.K. Rowling. <laughs> Snape ejaculated Slughorn. Uh, this is the same chapter. We've gotten grope and ejaculated in the same chapter. Immediately following Dumbledore's death, we've groped and we've ejaculated. Uh, so... Uh, one of the paintings in the room warns McGonagall that Scrimger will be arriving soon. So McGonagall gathers everyone together and goes, look, before this idiot shows up, here's the plan. <laughs> so the debate is whether or not to have the school open next year. Sprout thinks that they should keep it open. Slughorn isn't so sure. He doesn't even know if there's going to be people that want to be at the school. McGonagall reminds everyone that Dumbledore almost shut it down in book two. Flitwick says that they should consult the governors. And McGonagall then asks Hagrid his opinion. He is surprised because he is not a head of house, but McGonagall says, look, Dumbledore still respected your opinion, so I do as well, which I think is great. So cute. Mm -hmm. Hagrid, in an even cuter moment, says he's not leaving because Hogwarts is his home, and it has been ever since he was 13. McGonagall decides then that they are going to go through with Flitwick's plan, which is bring it to the governors, which I guess is good seeing that Lucius Malfoy isn't there anymore. It seems like he was the only really problematic governor, so it seems like a fine decision to go with them. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I don't know who these other governors are, but we don't have Lucius in play, and that always seemed like the thing that he was just bribing everybody. So maybe they're not the best because they were susceptible to Lucius's bribes, but without him, maybe they're fine. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I see the equivalent as like a board. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yes. So McGonagall moves on to how they should send the kids home. Harry asks about Dumbledore's funeral, though. The other house heads agree that Dumbledore should be buried here, even though no other headmaster has been before. So McGonagall tells them it was his wish to be laid to rest at Hogwarts. And that got me thinking about all the times Dumbledore and McGonagall probably just like were hanging. And how bad would you want to be a fly on the oh, wall in those conversations? Dude, so badly. Just them down in some fire whiskey. Oh, it'd be amazing. Like shooting the shit, like crying. <laughs> Telling war stories and stuff. Oh man, I'd love it. so good. They ultimately decide to have a funeral for Dumbledore before the kids head home, because as Harry said earlier, people are going to want to say goodbye. Scrimger is approaching. Harry asks to leave because he doesn't want to deal with this bullshit. McGonagall lets him, which, nice, great. I'm glad Harry doesn't have to deal with him, but next chapter, he will. So Harry gets to the common room. The fat lady is a mess. She asks Harry to confirm what she heard. He says, yes, she is crying profusely and then just opens without Harry saying any sort of password. So Harry goes in. The room is absolutely jam-packed basically just walks through without speaking or making eye contact to anyone. And Harry gets into the dormitory itself and Ron is the only other one in there. And they basically just stare at each other for a long time before Harry brings up that they may close the school. Ron then whispers asking about the Horcrux. 
Harry says no. Ron asks about R-A-B. And at this point, I gave it a little more thought. When I first read the chapter when Dumbledore dies, I didn't really think about it. But after reading it this time, I tried to think, okay, who are all the characters that we know whose initials are R-A-B or at least R-B? And I tried to go through R's. And I was like, okay, Remus, no. Uh, I couldn't think of anybody else with an R. I was like, not Rose Murta, not Ramilda Vane. So then I went to B and I was like, all right, well, Black, obviously. And then I remembered, doesn't Sirius have like a brother named Regulus Black? And wasn't he a Death Eater that tried to defect and then got murdered because of it? He seems like a perfect candidate for this. Sirius does have a brother named Regulus. Yeah. And wasn't he a Death Eater that tried to defect and then got killed because of it? Yes. Sirius does bring that up. Yeah, so this is my thought here. I need to know if his middle name starts with an A. I guess I could go back to, I'm assuming, Order of the Phoenix, and it would have on the family tree Regulus Black. But my guess is Regulus Black. We'll get into in the next chapter why I feel much more confident about this guess. Uh, But my initial guess here, Regulus Black. So Harry is not really bothered with R.A.B. The only thing that he can think about is that their whole mission was basically pointless because it weakened Dumbledore and led to his death. And while Harry thinks this, Fox's song fades out, and that's the end of the chapter. Then we get into chapter 30, The White Tomb, the final chapter of the book, and the final chapter, obviously, that we'll be covering in this episode. So all of lessons and exams are postponed. Some parents are picking up their kids early, like the Patils and Zachariah Smith, but Seamus refuses to leave with his mom when his mom shows up. So hell yeah, Seamus Finnegan, that's what I'm talking about, finally standing up to his mom, who has been identified as problematic previously. Seamus tells Harry that his mom had a rough time finding a room in Hogsmeade because witches and wizards are pouring in to try to pay their respects to Dumbledore, which is a very good sign. Maxime then flies in on her big old chariot. She embraces Hagrid. The ministry crew arrives. Harry tries to avoid them and successfully does. The squad and Ginny, we learn, have been inseparable since Dumbledore's death. They've been hanging out all the time, kind of just coping with the reality that they're in now. And Harry notes that he's bummed about it because the weather has been really nice and it makes Harry wish that he could have just enjoyed these nice weather days at Hogwarts with his new girlfriend. But alas, he has to do much worse things. (laughs) So Harry has this weird foreshadowing thing where he says that he knows he will have to leave Ginny his quote best form of comfort soon which I first read and I said oh no is Harry gonna bring up with Ginny and I hoped it wasn't true but spoiler alert it is he did the superhero thing he did it yeah it's we'll get into it later it's very stupid so Neville is out of the hospital wing but not Bill yet Bill apparently looks more like Moody than anything so he's got a bad scar situation but Personality-wise, he's acting the same, so that's good. The only difference is that he has a liking for very rare steaks, which Fleur loves because she says, the British always overcook your meat. (laughs) Which is very funny given I have lived in France before and you have lived in the UK. So in London, did they over, was meat like very well done because in France, they serve stuff very rare. At British places, it's pretty charred, yeah. Which is gross. Like not at sort of other types of global places and and Mm -hmm. i I sort of avoided (laughs) any sort of british food when i was in london i met i you know i I kept with the the um global types of food and yes i had so much yeah oh my god it's incredible i miss it so much when uh when i visited you that one weekend we ate indian food for every single meal did we go to dishoom yes that's my favorite restaurant in the world hey it was really good we only listeners (laughs) you're in london we only ate indian food for an entire three-day weekend And it was great, but let me tell you, I had a rough bout at the toilet for the next week, and it was very much worth it, It, because every other food option that we could have consumed would have been bad. I hope everyone feels like they know Mike a little bit better after this episode. (laughs) (laughs) So Ginny's surprised that Fleur's actually going to marry Bill. Harry says, oh, she's not that bad. Er, ugly, though, which I love that he added that up at the end. (laughs) Real ugly, yeah. (laughs) Which is like her one thing that is not up for debate is that she's super hot. I love that that's the thing he tried to knock her for. Hermione has a copy of The Prophet. Ron asks his classic question, if anyone they know died. Hermione says no, and they still haven't found Snape yet. Harry notes that they're probably not going to find Snape until they find Voldemort, which they haven't been able to do. As I read this, I realized Voldemort was never in this book, right? It was only in flashbacks as, I guess, Tom Riddle or whatever. 
But we had zero Voldemort in this book. This one and the third one are the two Voldemortless books so far. And maybe the seventh, who knows? Is the third one or the second one? There's no Voldemort in the second one. It was all diary Tom Riddle. I mean, there's young Voldemort. Yeah. Young Voldy, if you will. Sure. Young Voldy. But, and I guess here you could say it's young Voldy because it's flashback. Voldemort's not in the third book at all? No. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess he didn't really return. I guess in one he kind of returned and then went away. And then in four he came back. So I guess it makes mm -hmm. sense. But yeah, absolutely no authentic Voldemort in the present in this book, which I didn't realize until the last chapter. Pretty gutsy move of JK when she was writing the series, like at the beginning to not include the main villain, like until the fourth book, like as alive, obviously he was in it and present, but he was not alive. Right. Or mm -hmm. he was not the, in his, his human, whatever form, which is a pretty, pretty gutsy move, I think, but that's cool. Yeah. It's an interesting choice. And I think a very powerful choice that you have a villain that is so important that he's not really that major of a factor until weirdly the middle of the series and then the very end. Yes, he is in the first book, but barely and not even in his full form. Then he's gone for two and a half books and then he's there for the end of four and then I guess, you know, throughout five. But then he just takes a book off. <laughs> and, but we it's this great thing where he even without being in the books is such a present part. It's kind of like how Anthony Hopkins won the Oscar for best supporting actor in silence of the lambs, even though he's in the movie for a total of something ridiculous, like 14 minutes and 30 seconds. Damn. I didn't realize right? that. That's one of my favorite movie fun facts, even though Hannibal Lecter is not, in every scene or in the movie that much. He just has such a presence felt throughout the film. And Anthony Hopkins killed it in every scene that he's in that you just always feel his presence. And so much so that he feels like he's in the movie for way more than he actually is. Yeah, that's a damn good movie. Really good. Anyway, Ginny gets tired and goes to bed. And Ron turns away when she kisses Harry goodnight, which I think is funny. Hermione then leans forward, quote, with the most Hermione-ish look on her face. And this can only mean one thing, some more Half-Blood Prince shit. Harry excitedly goes, oh, is this about R.A.B.? And Hermione goes, no, it's about the Snape and the Half-Blood Prince. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say I told you so. Like, oh, fuck off. She does mention a bit about R.A.B., though. She says that she looked up the initials of R.A.B. and couldn't find any significant wizard that made sense. She mentioned some wizards with some weird names, but she says that she knows that the person had to know Voldemort. And I'm pretty sure that Regulus was a Death Eater. So the fact that she didn't bring up Regulus Black at all in this conversation makes me know that R.A.B. is Regulus Black. Because if it wasn't going to be Regulus Black, a person that we know about that has the initials at least R.B., she would have said, well, it's not Regulus Black because blah, 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 blah. So the fact that she has not decided and found out that it's Regulus Black or that she didn't rule him out makes me think it is <gasps> definitely Regulus Black. Hey, Mike, are you sure it's not uh, Scooby-Doo trying to say Ludo Bagman's name? <laughs> uh, Ludo Bagman? <laughs> Ludo Bagman? <laughs> yeah, we find out that something like Ludo isn't actually his first name. It's just a nickname. Yeah. Like, it seems like Robert Anthony <laughs> Bagman, Bagman that he goes by Ludo. <laughs> Dude, that would be the ultimate win for you. Oh that would my be the God. ultimate win for Except you. Except I have just cemented myself as thinking it's Regulus Black, so uh, uh, <laughs> no. Ludo's not showing up anymore in my guess. If he does, I'd be so ecstatic. She tells Harry, well, I was sort of right about the Half-Blood Prince business because, spoiler, plot twist, Eileen Prince was Snape's mom, which I did not see coming, but then Ron butts in, I thought she wasn't much of a looker. So again, we get in this whole ugly thing because J.K. Rowling loves talking about people's appearances. It's always very important. So what we learn is that Eileen Prince was a wizard and her husband was a muggle. It's a situation very similar to Voldemort. And Harry brings up that there's even more similarities because their nicknames are both royalty-based. Dark Lord, Half-Blood Prince... Harry asks how Dumbledore didn't see this coming, even with such obvious things like these nicknames. Hermione reminds Harry that he also didn't think that the Half-Blood Prince was evil, just clever, so it could be a similar thing with Snape to Dumbledore, where Dumbledore might not have thought Snape was evil, just clever, but, you know, we learn later Snape's not evil, blah, blah, blah. Hermione is shocked that Snape didn't know that Harry read the book. Harry said, oh, he knew once I did Sectum Sembra. Hermione then theorizes that he didn't turn in Harry because he didn't want to be associated with the book, which makes sense. Because if Snape brings Harry to Dumbledore saying, look, he's got my old textbook, which is helping him cheat in class. But then Dumbledore looks at the textbook and goes, what the fuck is all this, Snape? It makes a lot of sense that 
yes, Snape might have known about this situation, but didn't want to tell anyone because then Snape's probably going to get in trouble. Right. Oh, you, oh, you invented Sectum Sempra? Who the fuck are you? <laughs> I owe Kelly an apology because we had a bit of a back and forth in her episode where I thought that Snape didn't know because if he did know, he would have brought it up, blah, blah, blah. But Hermione perfectly identified why. Um, So apologies to Kelly because I was pretty certain that Snape didn't know or at least couldn't confirm. But this theory that Hermione's come up with makes a lot more sense that Snape just doesn't want to be associated to this potentially evil book. Right. Harry then regrets not showing the book to Dumbledore, thinking that it would have helped tip him off to Snape. Hermione tells Harry that she thinks he's putting too much blame on himself, citing that even she didn't think that the Half-Blood Prince was a killer, just a bad dude. Harry's kind of unsure about what to expect at the funeral, which is coming up. He's never gone to one before because his parents died when he was just a kid or a baby, and Sirius didn't really have one. So the next day, Harry gets up and gets ready to pack, and the Hogwarts Express is planning to leave one hour after the funeral. They're at the Grand Hall. Everybody's sad. Dumbledore's chair and Hagrid's chair are empty. Scrimger is in Snape's. And guess who else is there? Everybody's least favorite character and the true villain of the series, Percy Weasley. (laughs) Gosh, he's so bad. He's so, so, so bad. There's a John Mulaney bit where they talk about the kid who always, like, points out when it's after midnight on sleepovers, and you go, oh, remember that movie we watched today? And the kid's like, actually, we watched that yesterday, and they're like, oh, yeah. shut up, that's Percy. That's <laughs> Percy. Percy, that is, uh, or, yeah, it's, like, 12.30, and you say, oh, hey, good morning, you see someone at brunch, uh, it's the afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> it's pure Percy. Oh, uh, the worst kind of person. Or the kid in class, when the teacher doesn't assign the homework, and then do raises their hand. Uh, what's, what, what pages do we have to do for the homework? Homework's like, no, Percy! He Shut is, up, Percy! <laughs> <laughs> Harry notes that Crabbe and Goyle are muttering back and forth to each other, saying that they look, quote, lonely without the tall, pale figure of Malfoy between them, which I always imagine Malfoy is short, but I guess it's because of the movies that Tom, whatever, what's his, what's his name? Not Tom Holland, because that's Spider-Man. Tom Felton. So they, yeah, he's kind of short. So I guess it's a similar thing to Ron, because in the books, Ron is actually supposed to be taller than the twins. But in the movies, the twins are way taller than Rupert Grint. I need to recalibrate my brain to think that Malfoy is pretty tall, which I guess would make him more likely to be a bully because he's bigger than most people. So Harry hadn't given Malfoy much thought, but looking back on how scared Malfoy was and the awful situation that he was in, he kind of pities Malfoy, but he still despises him for his obsession with the Dark Arts, ultimately facilitating Dumbledore's death. So then the students head out to the lake for the funeral. And at first when they're heading to the lake, I was like, are they going to like throw Dumbledore in the lake? Like, I thought it was going to be like a funeral pyre thing where they oh, like that would be put it in so a boat badass. and then light it on fire. But they didn't do that. And they like, they like push him off and like the squid takes him. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. We forgot about the squid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he's like oh my god like who would who would shoot the arrow would it be hagrid which is like a massive crossbow just like yes. the flaming arrow <laughs> yes it would happen. Like, oh fuck the squid got him before the arrow <laughs> <laughs> we do get some awesome stuff at the funeral though so the students head out and a bunch of the order of the phoenix is there the narrator notes that Tonks's hair is bright pink again and she's holding hands with Lupin, which makes me very excited. <laughs> Among the people in attendance are Tom, the Toothless Walnut, Mrs. Fig, the bassist from the Weird Sisters, yeah. Ernie from the Night Bus, which made me think, oh yeah, what happened to Stan? <laughs> like, what, what, is he still just kicking it in Azkaban? But we will learn. Harry brings this up. And the answer is yes. Madame Malkin is also there. The barman from the Hogshead. The candy trolley witch from the Hogwarts Express. Dude, how badly would you want to go hang out with Dumbledore and the bassist from the Weird Sisters and just like get super fucked up with those guys? <laughs> no, I wouldn't choose the bassist from the Weird Sisters. The Weird Sisters lost a lot of cred for me in my brain because I thought they were an all girl band. And then I learned out they're an all dude band, which is not. Not as much fun. Yeah. They, I thought it was going to be like two girls, like Heim, but two people, sisters that play music together. That being said, the bassist from a wizarding rock band 
hanging out with Dumbledore and just, like, doing all crazy-ass wizard drugs. Like, I would love to be a fly on the wall for that. <laughs> Dude, anyone chilling with Dumbledore would be amazing. I bet Dumbledore would even have a good conversation with Lockhart or something. Yeah, but the bass is from the Weird Sisters. That, like, that, that would be of The only band. There are two bands in the Wizarding World. There are the Weird Sisters and there's Celestina Warbeck, and that's it. There's no other music. <laughs> Celestina Warbeck, who is apparently really, really, like, pure mom music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, Celine Dion level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's the comp. Yeah, it seems like a good comp. Neville and Luna are sitting with each other, which I want to happen so bad. They're my OTP. They're the ship I want to happen. I don't think it's going to happen, but I want it. I want it. What is it? OTP? One true pairing. Oh, never heard that. It's like a Tumblr thing. A Tumblr thing. <laughs> it's usually for a pairing that I don't think actually happens. It's your ship that you want to happen the most is your OTP. I believe. It's my understanding. So narrator Harry reveals that they were the only two, aside from Ginny, I guess, from the DA that answered Hermione's summons. So she did the coin thing, and Harry's guess is that they were the only two that actually kept their coins on them and checked them regularly, which explains why those two helped out and there was nobody else really helping out. Everyone else was asleep or just chilling. Can we just talk about how adorable that is? Very cute. That is so goddamn adorable. They're the best. I love Neville and Luna a lot. They're very, very good. They were just like, maybe they'll call me one day. Maybe they'll need me one day. Mm -hmm. And then they did. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, so then we get some interesting characters in attendance at the funeral. Uh, Rita Skeeter is there, as is Umbridge, which I don't know that Dumbledore would want either of them at his funeral. Seems like they'd be on the do not invite list. I like that they give umbridge an unconvincing expression of grief like that is a perfect description for what she was looking like yes very very accurate so then some strange music begins to play and Ginny notes that it's coming from the water it's the mer people and it is definitely much like fox's song a song of lament while the song is going on hagrid brings down dumbledore's body wrapped in a purple cloth and brings it up onto an altar of sorts and afterwards kind of walks back and Harry notes that on the other side, behind all of the chairs that are set up, is Grop, which I find it strange that everyone is just okay with him being there since isn't Grop a secret? Doesn't no one know about Grop? I think that's true and I think he's full giant. Yeah, he's full giant. He's a little smaller because he's a baby or he's a dwarf giant and that's why Hagrid took him in. He's the runt. He's the runt. Yeah, so he's still enormous but he's not as big as all the other giants. But... Hagrid has kept him secret in the force so that no one knows he's there. And now he's just at the funeral and nobody cares? Didn't he, like, wasn't he involved in the the ruckus in the Forbidden Forest with Umbridge when yeah. they brought her there? He saved Hermione and Harry. That's right. Man, this is quite the cast of characters. Yeah, I was baffled that nobody gave a shit that this giant was there. Yeah. And apparently he's dressed in some, like, rough formal clothes, which, how did you even get those? I never thought about it, but that is a great point. Who made those clothes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then craziness happens. These white flames just erupt from the altar and it completely engulf the body of Dumbledore and they leave behind a white tomb. So I don't, they never explain what this is or who did it or if someone made the spell or whatever. It's just flames show up and then boom, a tomb is there. So I hope they put the altar in the right spot because I don't know how they're moving that <laughs> unless they get Grop to pick it up. But now it's just like, ah, uh, shit, we put the, we didn't think, now we just got a tomb here on the lake. I hope they were okay, or at least someone knew that this was going to be the result. <laughs> that, oh, now we have a tomb in our front yard. I imagine it was well planned. Yeah. I feel like if your job is to plan wizard funerals, you've probably done this before. Sure. But then some more craziness goes down. A bunch of arrows just descend from the sky and fly in. And we learn that it's coming from the centaurs. And people were shocked and scared by both. So here's a thought. These people are very in their own rights to be shocked about this because these are very dangerous special effects. Shouldn't there be like some sort of program on all the chairs that says, yo, there's going to be a big old flames, big old pyrotechnics and arrows flying in from the forest. <laughs> I feel like this is something that people in attendance of this funeral should be warned about. Can you imagine if one of them had like misfired, just like right? fucking nailed somebody? <laughs> <laughs> You're shooting a lot of arrows. You have the potential of two of them kind of colliding in midair and then flying askew. <laughs> Just like Ernie Prags getting nailed in the cheek. <laughs> I mean, it would be good if maybe one hit Umbridge or something, but I don't know. W what if someone we liked got punctured with an arrow? Because they didn't know. Uh, That's what I mean, man. If Ernie Prags. Seems very, very silly, but 
Yeah, so that's going down at the funeral. Harry then turns to Ginny, and this is where he pulls a superhero breakup, where he basically says it's too dangerous for them to be together. Voldemort will want to go through her to get to him, blah, blah, blah. She is upset, but she understands. I hope that by the end of the book, I mean, I know they end up marrying each other and stuff, so I know it's going to be okay. I just hope that they're not separated or weird and awkward for too long. But if it follows normal superhero protocol, they'll be back soon. It's only a matter of time. You know, I don't know that this is a bad move by Harry. No, it's smart. It just makes me sad because they're so perfect for each other. That being said, he says Voldemort uses people his enemies are close to. Like, clearly the information is out there that they dated and then they broke up. Like, Voldemort would be able to deduce that even though they're not like FBO anymore, he could still like take her. Yeah, and, like, the only way they would know is if Malfoy found out. And if Malfoy found out, he would tell. Or I mean, but they were like publicly dating. But just in the school, like it's not like that's going to spread to like Antonon Dolohov. There's like so many Death Eaters children at that school. I guess, but I don't know. Aren't the Death Eaters that are being Death Eatery not around their kids? I mean, they're not going to, like, be publicly dating in front of Death Eaters after graduation either, right? They're not going to, like, <sighs> go to, like, Lucius Malfoy's dinner together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess the one concern would be if Malfoy found out, which he probably would Well, I just mean, like, it doesn't. it just doesn't make a difference whether they're official. You're thinking it doesn't matter for them to break up. Right, because it's already out there that they're, yeah. hey, you know, are in love or whatever. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Later, then, Scrimgeour comes over to Harry and asks for a word. Harry says, sure. Basically, doesn't look at him the whole time, though, which is great. So he also wants Harry to tell him what he's doing with Dumbledore, which, lol, nice try. Harry refuses because he's Dumbledore's man through and through. Harry asks, really, what's in it for him, telling him. And Scrimgeour says that the Ministry can protect him. And Harry says, there's no amount of protection that will keep him safe. Voldemort wants to duel and kill Harry by himself on his own. So Voldemort's going to do whatever it takes. They're going to have to fight. It's inevitable. Harry asks Scrimgeour if he's released Stan Shunpike yet, and Scrimgeour turns purple and then says, I guess you are. And Harry says, Dumbledore's man through and through. So <laughs> Harry effectively just tells Scrimgeour, get out of here. I love it. I love this. Harry is basically two for two on interactions with Rufus Scrimgeour, and I'm very excited about it. Yeah, Rufus Scrimgeour sucks. He's bad. He's really bad. Harry then gets with the squad, and he says that he doesn't want to go back to school next year. And they are very surprised, and they ask him what his plan is. He says he's going to go to the Dursleys because he has to for the love protection charm, and it's what Dumbledore would have wanted. Then he's going to go to Godric Hollows, and that's where he was born, right? That's where his parents lived? That's where, yeah, that's where the shit went down with his parents. Yeah, where they got where he was born. murdered. He doesn't know why. He just feels like he needs to visit, so I'm guessing he will go there and have some sort of self-discovery what are your thoughts on this plan i i don't know i think it's kind of silly because i feel like he needs some sort of accomplice that is not just ron and hermione to find these horcruxes and the other thing and this is a point that ron and hermione and other people have brought up when they talk about the school potentially being closed is that hogwarts is probably the safest place to be there's a lot of other wizards there they have protections on the castle itself it just seems like the smartest plan is to be at hogwarts and I don't know that if Harry's just roughing it, that that's really the smartest thing that he can do. Hogwarts is an interesting place in book seven. That's all I'll say. Okay. I'm excited to see what happens. So Harry says that after going to Godric's Hollow, he will go on and search for the four remaining Horcruxes before ultimately taking on Voldemort, the seventh Horcrux division of the soul. He has to, you know, take on him face to face. Ron and Hermione say that they are going to go with him and that they will be by his side while he does this. Ron does remind Harry, though, that they have to go to the burrow during the summer for Bill and Fleur's wedding. And Harry basically has this thought about the wedding, like, oh, wow, it's hard to think that there are some normal and happy things that can exist in this world, even with Voldemort on the rise and Dumbledore dead. But he does kind of have a, a happy moment thinking about it, and it'll be a nice escape from all the stuff going around them. And it being in the summer will be nice because once he starts to go on this search... Stuff's going to get real. And that is the end of this chapter. It's the end of this book. That's the end of this episode of Potterless. So, Johnny, how are you feeling about these two chapters? I mean, it's just heart-wrenching, heartbreaking stuff. You know, I've said that word like mm -hmm. ten times already. But it's just like... It is. It's accurate. She nails the grief. And I think one of the ways that she really nails the grief is not sort of capturing Harry as super sad right away. Mm -hmm. I think there is a certain level of numbness that she 
did very, very well in instilling into Harry. And then when he's at the funeral, you know, he has this moment of like overwhelming loss mm-hmm. and realizes what practically not having Dumbledore, you know, what that what that what that looks like from a tactical perspective going forward, mm-hmm. which I think is really, really hard hitting. But what about you, man? Done with my favorite book in the series. Oh, yeah, easily mine too. I seven is gonna have to be absolutely bonkers to topic because six was just so good. Every chapter is amazing. And yeah, these last two chapters are very well written. They really do cover the grief and just everyone coming to grips with the situation. It's a very sad ending to the book because it's basically two chapters of everyone feeling guilty and slash or sad about Dumbledore's death. Somehow we still managed to dick around our way through it. Oh, of course we did because we're the we're just two garbage human beings. But <laughs> the last chapter in particular was very well written, even though not necessarily that much action wise happened. We get a lot of really good Harry realization chapters and and getting insight into what's going on in Harry's head. And you're right, there are some really good moments where he has the realization. Oh wow, Dumbledore is dead. This is gonna be really hard. And it's it's a good moment to have. Man, I bet you can't wait to watch the funeral in the movie because it's so cool in the movie. <sighs> You've told me that it's not in it. And it makes me so... How do you not... Uh, how do you not have that in the movie? I don't get it. I don't understand. I know. It's so important. Uh, it's so important. Fact, it's so, that movie's going to be so bad. It's so visual. Right? That's the biggest thing is like, it's so beautifully written. And the way that J.K. Rowling laid it out, it, I could see everything. And it was so beautiful to picture it and envision it. And I can't believe the director did not want to bring that into the film for everyone to see because it seems so moving and picturesque. I I don't get it. The last thing I'll say, though, is that the the cave scene in the movie is spot on. It's so good. Okay, good. Does the boat look like the Flying Dutchman boat from SpongeBob? No, I'm sorry. Ah, damn. Okay, well. I'm sorry. You can't have everything you want, but at least we get a good scene there. So uh, that is the end of this episode. So Johnny, thank you so much for joining along. Uh, Listeners, if you want more Johnny, go check out his featuring in the bonus episodes on patreon.com slash Potterless. And listeners, thanks for listening. And until next time, as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Are we doing the thing? Yeah, but I need a thing. As they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, uh, before they uh, hop aboard the Hogwarts Express to head home. (gasps) Wizard Wizard on! on. (laughs) If you need some super last minute holiday gift ideas, why don't you head to bit.ly slash merch on and get some Potterless merch. We've got shirts, stickers, pins, posters, a bunch of fun stuff, all at bit.ly slash merch on. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Sadie Baird, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Serlopu, Alex Stark, Rebecca Adamick, Frank Chiotto, Martismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfeli, Eugenia Dassey, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan, Pontello, Benjamin Bridges, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romanian Rivadanira, Camille Doc, Anthony Bonarigo, Russell Dunk, Dustin Molan Cooch, Katie Rogers, Audra, Indiana Mercer, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Micah Cole, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power. Colette Smith, Chrissy Hutton, Trina Unacat, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Lovekesh Longer, Shivani Patel, Ellie Mountson, Calmage, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Kraus, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Hurd, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arnigan the Daughter, Brandy Baldonado, Melody McGinnis, Kristen Chavez, Jonathan Swaney, Zach Ross Klein, Elisa Figueroa, Daisy Curtin Sutter, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Jonathan Foy, Joe Harrison, Isabel, Steve Trelor, Vivian Santos, Samuel Minor, Victoria Renee, Elena, Takari Ronter, Lee and Ruiz, Brenna, Drake Perez, James Stett, Haley Hastings, Marino, Britton Morrison, Moster, Taylor Fulton, Hannah Shepard, Angelina Withred, Ross Marie Heise, Peter Bemis, Maria Vega, Fona Zebner, Natalie Lozano, Hermione Hoff, Victoria Julian, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Pasholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Cecily Togbull, Raul Avila, Julie Stuckey, Moussin Siddiqui, Grace Riggles, Sammy Curti, Raul Pineda, Ingun Oddstadter, Mary Wynn, Bran Wagner, Heidi Stoll, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Kamel Doc, Jen and Juice, Sefran Baez, Dusty Nickram, Noel Basile, Tao, Hala O'Keefe, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Rebecca Shumway, Taya Handlin, Patricia Colon- and can't I bother? Web design by Kelly Beckman and the music is by Bettina Campamanes. You can find us online at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, and instagram.com slash potterless podcast, as well as our website, potterlesspodcast.com. For bonus content, go to patreon.com slash potterless. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!